Okay, uh, hi Chem30. Um, I've got a helper here at home. My wife's videotaping this video. Uh, so, I'm going to finish off the lecture that I was um, discussing before the end of the day today. We were talking about alcohols. Um, I want to talk about, I talked about how to name alcohols and structures of alcohols. I'm going to talk about carboxylic acids too, but we're going to talk about how to make alcohols, um, like the industrial processes, and um, we're going to talk about what we make out of alcohols as well. So I'm going to introduce uh, hydration and elimination reactions, and I'm going to talk about carboxylic acids as well, and then that'll be the end of the uh, this lecture. So um, in your notes here, so if you bring the camera over. Okay, so <clears throat> this is uh, in your slides in the alcohol section. Um, so preparation of alcohols, first and foremost. Um, the most common way to industrially produce alcohols is to take an alkene and add water and then make an alcohol out of it. So this generally requires an acid catalyst. This is called hydration. So you can see the line structural diagram of the alkene here. This would be plus water with an acid catalyst, so you can see this is sulfuric acid, and then you would end up with an alcohol. So you can see this is one, two, three, four, this is butene, uh, uh, butuanine, and then this would end up being uh, butan 2 all. Um, right, so you can see the alkene here, so I'll, I'll <clears throat> so these are um, examples of taking an alkene and then turning it into a saturated hydrocarbon with hydroxide by adding water, so the HOH, so H and OH here with an acid catalyst. So we will open up these bonds with the acid catalyst and then we'll add the hydrogen and the hydroxide to either end of that double bond because you'll need, there's two open bonding spots there now, right? So kind of like an addition reaction with some different, just some different properties. So that's the most common way that we make alcohols. We make alcohols from alkenes for industrial purposes. Um, we also make ethanol naturally, right? So alcohols do exist naturally in nature. Um, you can see that this right here is ethanol fermentation. So those of you who took uh, Bio 20, you'll recognize this. So. We don't have oxygen as a final electron acceptor in the mitochondria, so we recycle our electron carrier molecules in the cytoplasm to um, accept electrons, and what that does is it converts the end products into ethanol. This also happens in your body with lactic acid fermentation, right? So um, lactate is really similar to alcohol, and that's why in high concentrations, it's toxic. All right, so. Uh, synthetic and natural ways to make alcohols here. Obviously this is the main way that alcohol that we use for consumption is made. So you start with a sugar and then uh, use anoxic conditions for glyco glycolysis to occur and then you convert um, the, the end products of glucose eventually into ethanol as we um, um, move the electron between the uh, product, between the reactant and the end product. All right, so there's no oxygen present here, and then you can use your distillation um, methods to increase the concentration of alcohol, right? Okay, so what can we get from alcohol? So uh, this is a, another big reaction, so you guys learned about elimination, sorry, you guys learned about addition and substitution reactions. You're going to learn about elimination reactions right now. Okay. Um, so an elimination reaction is an organic reaction where a small molecule, and it's usually H2O, usually water, um, is eliminated or taken out of a molecule. <clears throat> so
So, just like we use alkenes to make alcohols, we can go the opposite way to make alkenes. So, most of our alkenes are actually synthesized from alcohols. So, it's the most common way So the most common way alkenes are formed, right? So your double bonded hydrocarbons, okay? Um, so think about this, right? If I'm going to add water, that's a hydration reaction to make alcohols. That's dehydration. All right, so let me give you a few examples of, um, of these elimination reactions. So we can, let's start with something simple. Um, ethane cracking. Now this is how we can initially make alkenes. <clears throat> okay. Um, now I've talked about this as a, this is a specific type of hydrocarbon cracking, right? The, the ethane cracking makes ethene, and that is the, the, base poly, the, the base unit to make polymers of plastics, right? The ethylene monomer. Okay, um, so ethane cracking is a form of elimination. Okay. Um, I'm also going to call this dehydrogenation <clears throat> because I'm going to remove hydrogen. Okay? So, um, if I look at the ethane cracking, we'll start with an alkane, so just as a general formula and make an alkene plus hydrogen gas. So I'm going to start with ethane and then <clears throat> we're going to use catalysts to make ethene All right, plus H2 gas. Okay. Um, so this is one way to make alkenes. Now we can, as I just mentioned, we can synthesize alkenes from alcohols as well. Okay, and it'll look like this. So let's say I have ethanol. So this would be CH3. CH2OH, right? So, you know, typical industrial drinking alcohol. Um, what we'll do with this is use an acid catalyst. So let's say we use H2SO4. So I can dehydrate the molecule and I'll remove an H and an OH and we'll end up with water. So HOH as a waste product and um, uh, ethene. So another, so we'll end up with ethene again. Right, so ethane cracking can make ethene, but also the dehydration of alcohols can make ethene, and then this ethene again will be the basis of all the plastics that we use for, you know, industrial purposes today. Okay? Um, there's one more form of elimination reaction you should know about. And I just need to erase it. my board. Christina.
Um, we can synthesize alkenes from organic halides as well. So this is what happens in our petrochemical plants in Alberta, right? With these types of reactions are, are catalyzed and we make all of our useful petrochemicals from uh, the extraction of oil and natural gas from these processes. So the general equation for this is an organic halide plus a base. So hydroxide <coughs> will make, uh, sorry, will make an alkene plus water plus a free radical. Okay, so we'll, we'll kick a halogen out of there and it'll react with something else in the reaction. This is called dehydrohalogenation. <clears throat> so again, if I use the ethene example, uh, let's say, well, actually, sorry, I'm going to use um, chloropropane. Uh, chloropropane. Um, so let's say we have CH3, CH2, CH2. And there's a chlorine molecule attached to this terminal carbon. And then I'm going to react it with hydroxide. The byproducts of this end up being a chloroalkene. So CH3 double bond CH2. So, sorry, an alkene, not a chloroalkene. Um, and you can see what's happened is the chlorine is removed, okay, and there'll be an H plus removed. So reacting with a strong base, you get an alkene plus the hydrogen will react with the water to make H2O, and then you're going to kick the halogen out, and it'll end up being a free radical. Okay, um, so that's another elimination reaction. So, so elimination is the opposite of addition reactions, right? So addition reactions, I take unsaturated hydrocarbons and then remove the double and triple bonds and make single bonds. So all the bonds are occupied. With elimination reactions, I'm going to do the opposite. So I'm going to generally take a, a saturated hydrocarbon and then I'm going to react it with bases or acids generally in combination with water and then I make unsaturated hydrocarbons. Okay. All right, so let me just give you some general examples. Uh, these should be in my notes as well. Okay, so this shows ethane cracking, right? So it's not the same as hydro cracking of heavy oil, right? We talked about that, um, cracking heavy hydrocarbons into their base components. Ethane cracking is specific to ethane, right? So we always make ethene out of that. Hydro cracking is, uh, is, a, is a general way to break up large hydrocarbons like bitumen. Okay. Um, again, I showed you this elimination. Synthesis of alkenes from alcohols is an alcohol plus an acid catalyst. You're going to make alkene, uh, an alkene plus water, right? The acid catalyst dehydrates the molecule. Okay. And then I showed you the dehydrohalogenation as well. So our organic halide plus a base. So elimination reactions involving an organic halide here are known as dehydrogenation. We make water and a halogen or a halide ion and you make ethene again. <clears throat> so for elimination reactions, take a look at page 433, numbers 18 through 20, page four thirty three page 435 in your textbook, numbers 1 through 10. Okay, I'm going to leave that there, and I'm going to show you a few examples. So we can nail this concept.
Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this one. Write a structural formula equation. Write a structural formula equation to represent the reaction of two bromo propane with a base. So if it's with a base, and it's got, an, it's got a halogen on it, so this is dehydrohalogenation. So I'm going to make an organic halide as a product. So let's take a look at this one. I'm going to write this as a line structural diagram. So uh, bromopropane, so the BR is here. And then I'm going to react that with hydroxide. And here's what we make. We're going to, this is going to get kicked out of the molecule. So that's Br negative. And then um, I'm gonna, one of the hydrogens is going to end up bonding with the hydroxide to make water. Okay, and then what's left over is an alkene. So, um, have that left over, okay? Um, let's see another one here. So this one is butan to all. So we're going to make an alkene from an alcohol. Uh, reacts in the presence of concentrated uh, sulfuric acid. So this will be a dehydration reaction. Um, so Remember, uh, a dehydration reaction will be an alcohol, and you'll have a strong acid as a catalyst, and we're going to end up with an alkene plus H2O. Okay? So, um, butan2O, again, I'm just going to do this as a line structural diagram. The hydroxide's on carbon number two. Okay. Um, acid catalyst, so H2SO4. I could add heat to this as well to speed the reaction up. Um, the acid catalyst, so if I have a hydrogen attached here, right, there'll be hydrogens attached to the ends of each carbon. We're going to remove an H and an OH. That ends up as H2O. So now there's open bonding spots on these, on these carbons right here. So I'm going to end up with an alkene. Okay, and that is, that's elimination. Okay, so that's the end of alcohols. Um, I'm going to talk about carboxylic acids. We're going to talk about how to name carboxylic acids. And I'm going to end the lesson there and we'll talk about esters in the next lecture. Um, so we'll end this one really pretty shortly.
Okay, so carboxylic acids. Um, here's your functional group. So, right, remember the R represents a hydrocarbon chain. So it doesn't matter how many hydrocarbons are attached to the carboxylic acid. There's always going to be a C double bond OOH at the end of any carboxylic acid. So that's your functional group. So C double bond OOH is what makes a carboxylic acid a carboxylic acid. And you can have any number of carbons attached to that terminal carbon. Right, so remember the R group, this is your hydrocarbon chain and then attached to the R group is the functional group. So carboxylic acids, um, here's the deal, all right? They have a carboxyl functional group that has both a hydroxyl, so an OH, and a carbonyl group, so C double bond O, and the same C creates these. So C double bond OOH, so a carboxyl group is always at the end of a carbon chain because it takes up three out of four bonds on a carbon, right? So um, you have, you know, one, two, three bonds attached to this carbon, so there's only one more open bonding spot. So the double O bond OOH has to be on the end because the carbons that are in the carbon chain are already bonded to two other carbons, so they don't have enough space for that. So carboxylic acids... They are weak organic acids. So on your acid base chart, most of the weak organic acids, most of the weak acids that you have are actually carboxylic acids. So they do create hydronium ions when dissolved in water, but they're not, they don't completely dissociate, right? So most of the weak acid is left over. So organic acids are weak acids. They don't dissociate into hydronium as much as a strong acid would. They're used for flavoring, cleaning, soaps, pharmaceuticals, dyes, perfumes. They're the basis of amino acids, and most of the fats in your body are stored as um, are stored as long chain carboxylic acids. Okay, um, so triglycerols are three fatty acids with a glycerol molecule attached to it, and that is how um, we tend to store fats in our body as carbox as uh, tricarboxylic acids. Um, so if you were, we were going to do the ester lab, then you would have been able to see this, but butyric acid is an example. That's the smell of vomit. Um, when we name carboxylic acids, we're going to use the same general naming rules, but rather than having A and E or E and E or Y and E or all at the end of it, um, like we would for the alkanes, alkenes, alkynes, and alcohols like we've done in the past. You drop all those and add oic acid at the end. Okay, so page 438, numbers one through two, one and two, and number 10b are examples of carboxylic acids. Just before I name some of these, these are common names for some carboxylic acids. This is citric acid. Okay, so it actually has three carboxyl groups and an extra hydroxide. So this isn't really interesting carboxylic acid. So that's vitamin C. You have oxalic acid here, which is used in things like acne medications and then like making white dyes um, in clothing. Again, this is, uh, this is a chiral molecule, so it's a mirror image of each other. And you have two carboxyl groups attached to an ethane molecule. Okay, so these are special cases. I'm not going to talk about esters today. So, um... Let's name a bunch of these. So let's say I give you, let's start simple, let's say I give you that. So when we name the carbons, the carbons get named from where the closest functional group is. So this is carbon one, two, three. So this is three, so that's prop, right? So this would be propan, and then you drop the E at the end or the all, so this is propan oic acid. So the oic acid is what represents carboxylic acids. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so there is a carbon here. There's a line structural diagram. Again, this would be carbon number one. So one, two, three, four. So that's four carbons. So that's but, right? Butan, oic, 
acid. So that's how you name that carboxylic acid. There can be side branches as well. You won't see this as much with carboxylic acids. Um, so let's, uh, let's take one from a word problem. Let's say I give you octanoic acid. Okay, um, if I make a line structural diagram for that, right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a carbon here, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Double bond OOH, that would be octanoic acid. All right, so pretty simple. Um, I'll give you one with a side branch. So let's say we have this. So there doesn't have to be a carbon there, that'll just be an open bonding spot. But this empty space is where the carbon would be, right? Every time there's a dash or a break. So this is carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. So you always number from where the functional group starts, okay? You won't have alkenes and alkynes to worry about with, with carboxylic acid functional groups. So my parent chain is six carbons. All right, so that is a hex, right? Hex and oic acid. And now I have side branches, and one is one, two. So there's one side branch, and then one is one carbon, and there's another side branch. So I have an ethyl group on carbon number three, so that's three ethyl. And then I have a methyl group on carbon number four, so that's four methyl hex and oic acid. Okay, so the same rules apply. You identify the longest chain, number from the nearest functional group. There can be side branches. You won't see that a ton with carboxylic acids. Um, you, if you have side branches, you use the same rules that we've always used. Um, make sure that you number them in alphabetical order. There could be halogens on here too. The halogens come before the side branches. So I'll show you one that looks like that. So you're just building on skills you already know from previous lectures. So let's say I give you this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then let's say there's a fluorine, a fluorine, an ethyl group, and a methyl group attached to that. That'd be a really, really weird carboxylic acid. Um, but it's possible, right? You could move the hydrogens and put halogens on there and use this for some sort of industrial fat, maybe for a preservative or something like that. Um, so this would be carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Right, so there's seven carbons attached. So that, I'm gonna name the parent chain first. So that's heptanoic acid. All right, now give me the halogens. I have a halogen on carbon number two, and I have a halogen on carbon number four, and they're the same thing. But I could have bromine or chlorine or anything like that, but I just chose fluorine because it was what it was in my brain. Um, this would be 2,4-difluoro. So the halogens come before any of the side branches. So that is more important than whether or not they're in alphabetical order, okay? And now we put the side branches in alphabetical order. So I have a side branch here and a side branch here. And that's on carbon four, and this is on carbon number five. So when I name this, this ends up being uh, four ethyl, uh, five methyl. Parent is heptanoic acid, so that's a bit of a tongue twister. But that's how you would name like a complex um, carboxylic acid. So, so that's how you name them, and that's where you start, right? So the carbon number one starts at the functional group. Um, you can have side branches, but you drop the end suffix and add oic acid, but then the numbering system is still the same. And then all of the side branches are 
organic halides that are attached to the molecules, the naming rules are still the same. Okay? Um, and again, just a reminder, right, where we, where we name these alphabetically, we use the name of the molecule, we don't use the numbers of the molecule. So the dye doesn't count for alphabetical order because this is specifying how many fluoros. It's the fluorine that matters, but it's a halogen, so it comes before the side branches. All right, the ethyl comes in the alphabet before the methyl group. But if this was dimethyl, right, the methyl would still come after the ethyl group because the dye specifies the M. Okay, so right, the prefixes with the numbering don't count for the naming of the molecule. So just keep, you know, we've already talked about that multiple times, but just as a, you know, a last reminder for that. So, so the last um, hydrocarbon derivative that we need to discuss is our esters, and I'm going to do that in a separate lecture. So I'm going to sign off for that today, and you guys learned alcohols, carboxylic acids, and organic halides today. So have a good one.